You may be seated. Well, we learned that uh, Pastor Joe, we met with him a couple weeks ago, and he said that he wanted to wait until the 14th. And so we thought, well, you know, okay. <laughs> Pastor Danny did two weeks in, in September, and Pastor Scott did two weeks in September, and I only did one. So I said, oh, I think it's my turn again. So, and, uh, but Pastor Joe is, I texted him yesterday because he had some tests, and I thought, okay. Are you, are you definitely coming back so I can tell the congregation one way or the other? And he said, he's definitely coming back next Sunday. Okay, so that means you need to all be here. And if you are a guest with us and you've, you've, you've sort of started coming during his medical, he's been on medical leave for four months and so if you've just started coming, you're going to finally get to meet Pastor Joe. Okay, so make sure that you introduce yourself uh, to him. And, uh, but come and tell others that he's back. He's coming back. He's even coming to staff meeting on Wednesday. So that is good news for us. So, so therefore, it was like, okay, we, all, we finished James. What do you do for one week? And, and so we... We thought it would be good to transition from James. And when Pastor Joe starts next week, he's going to be starting a series on the pursuit of happiness. Okay, what it means to be happy. And he's learned a lot and he's read a lot. And so he's excited to share with some of that that he's learned. And so we're sort of transitioning. Okay, so this is a transition thought time. And so I thought it would be appropriate to take a test. Don't you love tests? No? This is an easy test. It's an open book test. Okay, so you can open your Bible to James and, and you know, and uh, we're going to take a little test. So just to see how well you listen during the month of, uh, of September. Uh, you know, I said October because Steve's sitting up here with a giant jack-o'-lantern shirt in front of me. <laughs> um, so Pastor Danny sp spoke on chapter one. What is one thing that we learned from chapter one in James? Anybody? Who's going to raise their hand and tell me? Okay, Sean? Okay, you ask for wisdom. Okay. Anything else? What, how, how did it start in the book of James? What? In times of suffering. Do you remember that? Being joyful. Oh. Ah. I'm pushing it and Bryson's pushing it all at the same time. So I'll let Bryson do it. Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, have you had a trial this week? Yeah. Did you consider it joyful? Well, that's what the scripture said. So what are we, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to practice that. Okay. And we learned our, our sort of our motto. What was it? Um, Know it, own it, and live it. You got it. Okay, so what did we learn in chapter 2? Danny also preached from chapter 2. What, what did we learn? Iris? Good job, Iris. Iris, you got an A. Okay. In the same way. Oh, wait. Sorry, that's the second part. Uh, uh. Okay. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Again, we have to practice that, don't we? Because we do that. And he said we shouldn't do it. And then he talked about faith in the last part of chapter 2. What was that about faith? Faith without what? Without works is dead. In the same way, 
faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Our faith should move us towards action, towards doing something, towards doing what he wants us to do. Then I came in week three. What, what did I preach on? Trey? Taming the tongue. This thing that gets us in trouble all the time. And it said, and it's something that we can't tame on our own, can we? That's why we need the Lord so much. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My si brothers and sisters, this should not be. We shouldn't praise God on one hand and then tear somebody down on the other hand or criticize them. We shouldn't do that as the body of Christ. Okay, then Pastor Scott took over week four. Anybody remember? He sort of focused on about four verses. Remember what, that, what those were? Anybody? Iris again. Okay, that was the beginning. Yes, it talked about why are there conflicts among us and why are there conflicts? Because we want what we want. Yeah, that's why we have conflicts. What else did he say? And remember this uh, thing here? Submit yourself to God. That humble yourself before him. Submit to him. Resist the devil. And he will what? He will flee from you. I've been doing that the last couple of weeks. I resist you, Satan. Flee. Uh, draw near to God. We draw near through reading our, the Bible together, spending time in prayer. We draw near to God. And what will God do? If we draw near to Him, if we come near to Him, what will He do? He will come near to us. So if we never come near to Him, will He come near? Well, He still wants to. He maybe moves in us to come near me. Okay, and then last week, Pastor Scott preached again. Anybody remember? Nope, that's an honest answer. Good job. Nope, I don't. Here you go. This is towards the end. It talked about, remember the rich and woe upon the rich? You know, and then, it, and then at the end it talked about prayer. And it said, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. That's why we need each other, so that we can pray for one another, so we can, um, whatever you're struggling with, we can come and pray with you over. So that is the little portions of those five chapters, and there's a ton of other stuff that maybe you read, but we did have a memory verse. How many memorized the verse? James 1.25. Sherry, you get an A+. Plus. Sherry's the only one that memorized the verse. Oh, how many tried? You tried. Okay, you get an A, okay, for trying. So let's say it together. I don't know if you didn't even try it. And, okay. Let's say it together. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James 1.25. We're going to read it one more time. Just maybe, you'll, maybe it'll just soak into you. Okay. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James 1.25. And that verse tells us what we should be doing. We need to daily, intently look into the Word of God. Spending time, if you're, if you're not spending that time in the Word of God, 
you're going to flounder. You're going to struggle. Because what does the word of God give us? According to that. Freedom. And then if we hear it, and we don't forget what we hear, but we do it, we will be what? We will be blessed. And what's another word for blessed? What could you substitute for the word blessed? Joy. Joy. Okay. Reward. Reward. Okay. Taking care of. Successful. You know what blessed means, really? Happy. Happy. You could substitute that. But who, 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 and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be happy in what they do. So, we're going to look at that a little bit today. Because... When you look at God's word, you have to, first of all, trust that what God is saying is true. And then you have to obey what God says. So today's trust and obey. So there's a simple chorus. It's an old hymn. Maybe you know it. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So I want you to picture in your mind this scene. There it is. The scene is a hotel suite in Jacksonville, Florida. Got that in your brain? Got that in your mind? This nice hotel suite, oh, maybe overlooking the ocean. Okay? It's midnight on New Year's Day, 2002. Now, what happened four months earlier? 9-11 happened. Okay? So this is four months after that. Condoleezza Rice. Remember her? Who was she? Secretary of State. Okay? Um, Very influential woman. She and a few of her friends had gathered in this hotel suite following the Gator Bowl football game between Florida State and Virginia Tech. They had enjoyed a dinner together. She is an avid football fan. During their time of fellowship and conversation, Rice joined hands and hearts with her guests, and she prayed for them. And she prayed for their future. She prayed for the condition of the world. Because that was a tough time. Some of you weren't there yet. Okay. But it was a tough time. It was a painful time. A lot of us were praying for the condition of our world. Because we didn't know what was coming. And then they lifted their voices. And they sang this song. That I'm going to sing for you. They sang it, his eye is on the sparrow. They joined hands, they sang the song had become famous during the Billy Graham evangelistic crusades, as well as when Ethel Waters, this wonderful gospel singer, sang it with great crusade choirs. Now, I'm no Ethel Waters, okay? But I'm going to sing it for you. And you can sing along. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. 
Yes, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. My turner's not turning. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Then we hear some words of Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender words I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubt and fear. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Sing the chorus with me. And I sing because I'm happy. Yes, I sing because I am free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, are you tempted? Whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, has that ever happened to you? Your hope has died. I draw then closer to him, from care he sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Yes, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Now the chorus. And I sing because I'm happy. Yes, I sing because I am free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Yes, his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Now here's the story behind that hymn. The song had an unusual birth. It was authored by Sevilla D. Martin, a Canadian lady who had been educated in the schools of Nova Scotia. She taught school for a short time before meeting and marrying Dr. William Martin, an evangelist and musician of sorts. Together they enjoyed an itinerant ministry. That means they went from place to place preaching the good news, from this church to that church all over. Sevilla, who wrote the lyrics, said this about her inspiration to write the song. These are her words. Early in the spring of 1905, my husband and I were sojourning in Elmira, New York. We developed a deep friendship for a couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle, true saints of God. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for nigh 20 years. Could you imagine? Bedridden for 20 years. Her husband was an, an incurable cripple 
who had to propel himself to and from his business in a wheelchair. Did they have life easy? Okay. Taking care of her as well as being bound in a wheelchair. Sevilla continued, despite their afflictions, they lived happy Christian lives, bringing inspiration and comfort to all who knew them. One day, while we were visiting with the Doolittles, my husband commented on their bright hopelessness, ho sorry, hopefulness, hopefulness. Uh, you know, that tongue gets in the way, doesn't it? Wrong words. My husband commented on their bright hopefulness and asked them for the secret of it. Mrs. Doolittle's reply was simple. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. The beauty of this simple expression of boundless faith gripped the hearts and fired the imagination of Dr. Martin and me. The song, His Eye is on the Sparrow, was the outcome of that experience. Dr. Martin tried his hand at writing a musical setting for the poem. Remember, it said he was sort of a musician. If you heard that earlier. So he tried to write the melody, but they weren't satisfied with it at all. They then sent the lyrics to Charles H. Gabriel, an experienced musician and songwriter, asking him to write some fitting music for her lyrics. He did so, and his melody has been the vehicle that carried Sevilla Martin's poem around the world. That's where that came from. Now, sometimes we think, we have it hard, don't we? Here is a couple that even in the midst of difficulty had, they were happy. They had joy. And part of that in James, consider it all joy when we face sufferings of many kind. And so we're looking at um, that hymn as well as a portion of Scripture. Now, the reason that the Doolittles were so strong was because what? They had a personal relationship with the Lord. That's where their joy came from. That's where their happiness, even in the midst of their suffering, came from. Their walk with the Lord. They, she knew, Mrs. Doolittle knew that God was watching out for them, even in the midst of it. And all relationships, aren't they? All, we've learned this recently. All relationships are built on trust, are they not? They're all built on trust. And even our relationship with the Lord is built on trust. Do I really trust what Jesus said? Do I really believe that the Word of God is truth? And trust is built on truth. We have to believe that what God's Word says is true. If we question it, then will it be any wonder that we question trusting God? Whereas if we trust and we believe in what God's Word says is true, we can walk in this relationship of trust and obedience. So, we're going to look intently into the Word of God, so get your Bible out if you have it. If you have your phone and your Bible's on your phone, my Bible's right now is on my tablet, okay? You can get your Bible out. You can use it. If you brought your Bible open to Psalm 139, Psalm 139, we're going to read this. Now... I work with children all the time, and I know that worship can sometimes be really hard for kids. And so this morning, I've chosen to print it on the wall in the New Living Translation because it will help kids understand. 
and it helps me to understand, to be honest, okay? But you can read it in whatever translation you want, whatever Bible translation you want. So we're going to look intently into this. Are you ready to look intently? So listen carefully. Don't distract somebody because then you're not looking intently into it. This is a psalm of David. King David wrote this psalm. And it was a song. All of the psalms are songs. Now, we don't know what tune it went to. Um, but here it is. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I, rust, when I rest. There's that tongue again. When I rest at home. You know everything about me. You know what I am going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I'm in verse 7, if you're in a different translation. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Verse 13. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Verse 17. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Verse 19. O God, if only you would destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers. They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name. O oh Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred, for your enemies are my enemies. Verse 23. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends me, you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So that's the word of the Lord. That's Psalm 139, a tremendous psalm, a psalm of encouragement that the truth is that God sees us and he watches us. He knows all about us, the good, the bad, and the ugly, doesn't he? 
So let's look at what he knows about us. In those first few verses, verses 1 through 6, what does he know about us? What does the Lord watch? He watches over what? Our every movement. What did it say in there? What did it say? He watches us. He sees us when we what? He, he, watched, he sees us. He saw you when you sat down in your chair for worship this morning. He saw when you stood up to sing. He was aware if you sang or if you didn't sing. <laughs> or if you danced and you didn't dance on that one song. He was aware. Was he aware when you got up this morning and hit the alarm clock and said, do I have to get up? Those were literally my words this morning. Do I have to get up at 545? Okay. You know, he sees that. Did he see what you ate for breakfast this morning? He saw this morning that I ate the same type of food that I ate when I was in high school. An English muffin with peanut butter and honey on it and a banana. My life has not changed that much. <laughs> okay? He saw that. Did he see you drive to church this morning? Okay. Because it said he sees when we travel, doesn't he? And he's going to see when you go home and rest. He's going to see it. He's well aware of every movement you have. He sees it all, even when it's Hard to lift it up, huh, Carol? He sees it. He sees, he watches over every thought. He knows every thought you have. He knows what you're thinking right at this moment. He knows every thought that you'll have your entire life. You don't, do you? But he does. And he, see, he watches every word you say. He, he knew that at this service I was going to say hopelessness, didn't he? He knew this service that I was going to say rust instead of rest. Did he not? Because he knows every word even before we what? Say it. He does, you know, and, and we have to have a sense of humor too. Um, he knows everything that we're going to say. He, he sees it all. It's not surprising to him. We try to cover it up when he, he already knows. He knows those deep thoughts that nobody else knows. So he watches over all that. That's how intimate he is with us. In that next portion, when we're trying to escape from the Spirit, have you ever tried to escape from the Spirit? Maybe play hide and seek with God? Have you ever tried that? Where you know you're not living the way that God wants you to live, and you're trying to hide in darkness? The Lord watches that. He, want, he watches when we wander. You know, when we're playing, Katie, do you like to play hide and seek? Yeah. Especially with Connor there, huh? Yeah. Our, our daughter, Joanna, she has this pet stuffed animal named Noodles. It's a poodle Gracie gave her. Oh, she's not in here right now. But Gracie gave her to us when we first got Joanna. Well, lately, she tells me after I drop her off at school, Dad, make sure you hide Noodles somewhere in the house. So that when she comes home from school, she has to play hide and seek with noodles. You know? Well, we, uh, we try to hide from God. We know that we're not living the way God wants us to. We know we're looking more towards the world's way than His ways. And He sees it. And He watches it. We're not hiding from Him at all because He sees it. We think we're being so cool and... So hot because we're doing our own thing. And he's just going, why? He loves us. He, he sees us during that time. The next part. 
The Lord watches every moment of your life. Now, this is where he just knows all about you. He knows the moment you were conceived. He knows that moment. He watched when you were in your mother's womb. And each part as you developed, he saw. He was well aware of it. Nothing was hidden from him. Some of you, or you may know of somebody that was born with a birth defect, and sometimes we don't understand that happens. I know people with that, and, and even when the, with those birth defects, God knew that that, was, that part of their body was not being born at that time. You, there's that guy that, I don't know if you know him, he has a tremendous story, and he's spreading the good news of Christ all over Nick, Nick, um, you know, I can't, Vic, they, he calls himself chicken leg, okay? He was born with um, no legs, no arms, and you can look him up, Nick something, starts with a V, and he just has a little flipper foot right here. That's all. God is using him immensely. They had, his parents had no clue that that was going to happen to him, that he was going to be born until he was born. They live in Australia. His mom was even a nurse. And he was born. God saw all that when Nick was being formed. It didn't surprise him. God had a purpose and God is using him immensely in our world today to share about Jesus and to tell people about it. he he swims <laughs> he plays the drums you have to look him up he's amazing god saw it and he saw you and he knows the number of your days doesn't he do we know the number of our days Yesterday, I did a memorial service for a couple. Um, she used to come to this church when she was a teenager. And she had a stillbirth. They had a stillbirth. Um, last Monday, their baby was born, and it died on the same day it was born. God knew. God knew the number, the day of that, her child. Okay? He, he, we have no guarantee that when we leave this place that this, we won't be here next Sunday. We may not be here. Somebody here might not be here next Sunday. We don't know. But he knows. He knows the exact day that you're going to die. The exact minute. He knows it. He knows what you're going to face. I mean, he knew that Terry and I would face six and a half years of infertility. He knew that my dad would have dementia. He knows if I'll come down with dementia. I don't know that. I don't want that. But he knows if that's going to happen to me. He knows in advance if we might have cancer or some disease or heart problems. He knows all that stuff. He knew even when I was in high school and I put that English muffin and and banana, I always had the glass of milk. He knew that about five years ago I would become lactose intolerant. <laughs> Did I? No. He knows. He knows all about you. He knows your future. Okay? He's well aware of every moment of your life. It says it, it, what does it say? Every day of your life was recorded in his book. Every moment was laid out before a single day passed. Wow. Is our God amazing? Because he knows all about us, but he knows about everybody on the whole, in the whole world and everybody throughout history. The next part. 
The Lord watches over us with many thoughts. Did you, are you aware that God is constantly thinking about you? Isn't that what David wrote in here? That how precious are the thoughts about you? They're precious. And what did David say? They cannot be what? They cannot be what? What? Counted. They cannot even be counted. And his thoughts towards you outnumber what? The grains of sand. Have you ever been to the beach and counted grains of sand? Good luck, huh? Maybe after 10, I'd be done. If you can even count that many. But his thoughts, he thinks about you. His mind is on you. They out, his thoughts towards you, his love for you, outnumbers the grain of the sand. And the Lord watches those who what? Who trouble you. Do you have somebody that troubles you? Somebody that Rick Warren calls them crazy makers. They drive you crazy. David, did David have some people that troubled him? Before he became king, who troubled David? Saul. What did Saul try to do to David? Tried to kill him. Then when David became king, who troubled him? Well, Saul was dead by then. His sons, yeah. His son took the kingdom from him. Remember when King David had to flee? There was one guy. What was one guy doing? He was throwing rocks at King David. Okay? <laughs> Do you ever wonder why he's, David said this? Oh, God, if only you would destroy the wicked. <laughs> those people that cause trouble in our world, those people that are mean and cruel and they bully people and those people that are just hard to be around. You know, he watches those. He sees who you face, those hard situations. So he sees all that. He watches. He watches over every mo movement you make, every thought you have, every word that comes out of your mouth. He watches you when you wander away from him. He watches every moment of your life. He sees what you're going through. The Lord watches over you with many thoughts. The Lord watches those who trouble you. So if he sees you that much, he is so intimately aware of your life. The pain that you've had, the joys that you've had, he's so intimately aware of who you are. Should we not trust him? Of anybody, shouldn't, shouldn't we trust him above anybody else in our lives? Because nobody knows us like God does. Nobody loves us like God does. And so, because we are loved, because we are known, we can trust him. And our response because remember, all relationships are built on trust. You know, trust him completely. That's what he wants you to do. And as you trust him, he wants you to come to him and talk to him. Whoops, sorry guys. Go back to that one slide. He wants you to pray. He wants you to be intimate with him. He wants to be intimate with you. And so be intimate with him. He already knows what you're thinking anyway, so if you're mad, tell him, I'm mad. He knows if you're sad, he, so tell him, I'm sad. Lord, here I am. This is what I feel right now. Trust him. Pray. And then what? Obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to...
to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. David ended that psalm in this prayer. And so let's pray this prayer together. Can we do that? Let's read it together. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That path of everlasting life. What are we going to find on that path? Peace, happiness, joy, contentment, satisfaction. Let's read it again. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Now, in the chair right in front of you, there's this tan-colored card. Pick that up. Get it in your hand. There's a pen. There should be a pen there, too. Put your name and information on it. But there are some ways that God... You know, whenever you hear God's truth, you have a choice to follow it, dismiss it. If we follow it, it leads to peace, happiness. If we uh, dismiss it, it can lead to destruction. So pray for me and check the box that applies to you. Say, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to fill out this card today? Pray for me as I put my trust in the Lord, perhaps for the very first time. Or perhaps it could be put my trust in the Lord completely, completely in Jesus. So whether it's the first time or completely, if that's what you feel that led to do, pray for me as I respond obediently in actions and words. Check that. Pray for me as I ask the Lord to search my heart. Maybe you're going to pray this prayer every day this week and search me. Spend the week this week in letting Him search your heart. And then pray for me as I return to the Lord through repentance. Maybe you're one of those that you've wandered and you've allowed sin to uh, creep in and, and hinder your relationship, your fellowship with the Lord. And maybe you want to, you know, repentance, return, repentance is just saying, God, I know I've sinned against you. And I come to you humbly, repenting before you cleanse me of all unrighteousness.